And that's where we, it's interesting because that's where we are in Romans. And so I'm going to give you the, the uh, scriptures. We're in chapter 13. Now, some of you might have your, your cowboy Bibles. And if you do, you can, you can turn to chapter 13 in Romans because we're going to be dealing with verses 1 through 7. And if you don't, I'll read it out for you. And uh, we'll go through this. And some of you, you might say, well, gosh, I'd like to have the verses of that, and I'd like to have the notes. Then, then get my business cards in the back and email me, and I'll send you the notes, and all the scriptures are on there. And I'll give them to you. So, this is kind of a well-known chapter, uh, chapter 13 in Romans, and it deals with the Christian and his relationship to the government. Now, let me just be honest with you. A lot of times, I don't believe in being violent. When it comes, I mean, uh, I don't agree with everything the president does. I don't agree with everything his administration does. But I don't think that it's right for the pastor to take a stand from the pulpit. Amen? Amen? Okay, and I won't do that. And I found out the hard way what happens when you do that. I went to Montana, and uh, I assumed, and you know what happens when you assume? <laughs> do I have to spell that out? I went to Montana and I assumed, because it was Montana, that it was a conservative group of people. But I was in Laurel, Montana, and it's a little town of about 7,000 people, and it's about 20 miles south of, of Billings. And of course, Billings is known for its conservatism. And, uh, but there are two industries in Laurel, Montana. One is the huge oil refinery, which is run by the union. <laughs> and as you know, unions tend to be very liberal in their political views. And the second industry in rural Montana is the railroad, which is also run by the union. So I started off spouting my conservative blab. <laughs> and nobody was laughing. <laughs> no, can you imagine nobody laughing at my jokes? Well, that's what was happening. And then I had to stand at the back and greet everybody when they walked out. And of course, everybody walked out the back. And I found that about half of the people in the church were going out the side door. <laughs> And uh, so I learned the hard way. You know, it, it turned out that the bulk of the people in the town of Laurel were actually very liberal, and, and, which is okay. And I'm gonna show you that uh, biblically today. Uh, because that, I want you to be thinking about it. So is God conservative or is he liberal? What do you think about that? Well, I'll answer that question. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that uh, we've all been privy to, we've all watched what's going on in politics on television. And, um, you know, uh, it's not hard for us to think of presidential candidates like, like Ted Cruz. I'm going to pick some, some conservative ones here. Ted Cruz or Ben Carson. Does anybody have any trouble seeing those two guys as servants of God? No. And why? Because we've seen their personal professions of faith on TV again and again. All right? But I wonder something. Have you ever thought of Vladimir Putin as a servant of God? He's an atheist, isn't he? How about Osama bin Laden? Have you ever thought of him as a servant of God? How about Adolf Hitler? No way. No way. You sure you want to say that? Yes. Okay. All right. And yet the amazing thing of what the scripture passage declare that men, like I just explained, in some sense are servants of God. In other words, they may not think they're serving God, but God is using them is the point. And I think this shows how much we need to have our minds renewed 
and our thinking changed. Uh, and, and we saw that in the 12th chapter of Romans, didn't we? Remember what the 12th chapter taught us? We should never be conformed to the thinking of the age or the thinking of the world or those that are around us. Remember that? Remember how important that was? And so sometimes, could it be that that thinking flows into our politics? In other words, it, it's more, we think it's godly, but could it be that it's more based on what the world is saying around, or what the conservatives, and not necessarily the church conservatives, are saying around us? So, one of the first things the Apostle Paul tells us about our government is where it comes from. Where does it originate? Well, the answer is given in the first verse of, uh, of, of chapter 13. And here it is. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. So 50% authority comes from God. Yes? How much authority comes from God? All. All. Well, yeah, but some of those authority people are, are atheist. How much authority comes from God? All. All. And those in positions of, of authority have been placed there by God. Now, that's the biblical position. When Paul refers to governing authorities... He uses a phrase that can be best be translated. In a lot of the translations, the phrase he uses are the powers that be. Now, when he says the powers that be, he's not just talking about the heads of state. He's talking about all levels of authority, all the way down to the local dog catcher. I think of some of these protest groups on television, on the news a lot, protesting the police. What are they doing? Who are they protesting, really? They're protesting God, aren't they? They're going against the authority that God has placed there. Those people, now, are there bad policemen? Yes. Sure there are. Because what are they doing? We were born with a sinful nature. And if they haven't accepted Jesus, what kind of a nature do they have? A sinful nature. They've done nothing about that. But even the ones with a sinful nature, a lot of times, can be good policemen. And sometimes they're crooks. But that's not our problem, is it? That's, that's for God to deal with. So, what Paul is telling us is that we've got to think about these governmental offices uh, like they are. In other words, that they're brought about by God himself. And we often hear people ask this question. Well, what, what form of government is best? And, uh, of course, certainly we in, in our country, in the, in the United States of America, we often think that our form of government is best, is, don't we? Even to the point of pushing it off onto people who don't necessarily want our form of government. And we're finding out, especially in the Middle East, that that isn't necessarily the best strategy. Amen? Amen? Okay, we thought it was for years and years and years. But a lot of people over there don't want our form of government. And they're really not in a frame of mind where they can handle it to begin with. So, so you might ask yourself, well, which government is the best kind? Is it a monarchy, which is one, one person, like a king? is an oligarchy, which is a group of people, a small group of people running the country. Uh, is it a republic? Is it a democracy? And the answer of scripture is not necessarily any of these. The answer is, it's whatever God has brought into being. And that's best for that particular place and time in history. Now, you might argue with that. You might say, well, gee, I don't, I don't think that Stalin could, that I would argue that that was best for that particular country at that time, or Hitler. Well, there was a lot of things that led up to Hitler before he became the tyrant that he was. And the country was struggling financially. And he took them out of that. 
Okay, there were a lot of things that he did that were not necessarily bad at the beginning, especially. And, and so um, the question is, was he right for the country at the time, at that time and place? And so God doesn't ordain any one form of government to be continued forever as well. That's something else. If the people grow toward understanding of truth, and if they grow in their morality, and that prevails in the community, then the form of government may well take on a democratic pattern. But let me tell you something, folks, that's true in the opposite form as well. If they start out in a democratic, and they let their morals go, and they get off of truth, guess what happens? They open themselves up to anarchy, don't they? Have we seen that in our streets? So I'm explaining to you what's going on. It's nothing new. Now, the point the, the Apostle Paul makes is whatever form of government you find, God is behind it. Now, this truth is not just confined to the New Testament. You'll find it in the Old Testament as well. In, in the book of Daniel. Daniel stood before one of the greatest monarchs the world had ever seen. Also one of the greatest tyrants. Remember who that was? It was Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> one of the most tyrannical of kings. And Daniel spoke to Nebuchadnezzar and he said this, God changes times and seasons. God removes kings and he sets up kings. So that's basically a principle that God brought out in the Old Testament as well as the New. Would you agree with that? Okay. He changes times and seasons and God removes kings and he sets up kings. Now, here it's made clear that God definitely has a hand in whatever is going on in the earth at a particular time. Sometimes we're tempted and even taught to think that God is somehow being remote in our political affairs and, and that he's off in heaven somewhere turning a rather blind eye on us human beings because we're struggling along with our political problems down here. But scripture never takes that position. Never. He's not on some remote mountain on Mount Olympus somewhere. He's right here among us involved in the pattern of our governments. And he raises up kings and puts down others and raises up rulers and changes the form of government. That's right. That's what he does. Now, the apostle Paul also makes that clear in Romans 13. Now, let me just stop right there. You might say, well, gee, if that's true, Paul, if that's true, Pastor, then there's no reason for me to even vote. I'm just going to leave it up to God. Well, what do you think happens if you don't vote? If the country is on a downward slide because it's losing its morals, and it's on a downward slide because it's losing its direction, its godly direction, what do you think would happen if all the people who are godly quit voting? we continue on in the path that we're going. So the point I'm going to make is there's something that you can do. You can vote. You can get involved. But I want to emphasize that is not what we're called. That's not why you're on the earth. Why are you on the earth? To disciple and bring people to Christ. You're part of the plan, remember? So, I'm not saying... Don't just take a dim view of this. I'm not saying don't go vote. I'll be the first one. I'll be the first one to tell everybody in our church. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I'm going to say you need to go vote. That's important. That's a privilege. It's part of our country. It's something God gave us. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to Romans and to these Christians, they were living in the capital city of the empire, which was Rome. And Rome by this time had already passed through several forms of government. It had been a monarch. It had been a republic. It had been a principate. Now you'll say, Pastor Bill, you're using those big words again. You know, I know you went to Arvin High, and I know you, <laughs> you learned them, those big words. Some of you went to Arvin High too, didn't you? Yeah. I'll explain what a principate is in just a moment. 
But now at this time, it was an empire. Okay. Now a principate, and I have to tell you, I had to look this up. <laughs> And what really made me mad, I've got this great Bible dictionary on my computer, and I looked, and I went to my computer, and I looked it all up, and everything, and it wasn't in there. So, when you, you know, so when all else fails, you go to where you can't find anything, you go to Google, <laughs> and you Google it, and I found it in Google. Okay, what a principate was, and is, is where you have a monarch, a tyrant, in charge, but he wants to preserve the idea of a republic. And so you have a Senate, you have all the working forms of a democratic form of government, but you still have the tyrant, but he's still a tyrant, and they just basically go through the motions. And that's what Paul was dealing with in Rome at the time. Nero was the emperor. And I don't know if you spent much time in your history or not, but Nero, remember the story of Nero? He basically set the whole town on fire and then fiddled on his, his violin while it burned. And that's a true story. And it was Nero who persecuted the Christians. He's the one that set up the lions in the arena and all of that. So, as we look at the Apostle Paul and what he has to say about government, and Peter and some of the other leaders remember here that all of this is going on. Because we could say, well, gosh, but you just you just don't know about our president. He's an ungodly man. You know, well, that may be your opinion, okay? But what we're going through today is nothing like the Christians had to go through in Rome at the time that this scripture was written. Okay? So, so Paul, Paul wrote this out. And uh, what Paul was saying to these Christians is whatever the form of government and whatever is in control, again, remembering the point that God is behind it. Not only is God behind the forms of government we have, but he's also responsible for the officials, the ones occupying the offices at the particular time. Now, listen to the way that the New English Bible translates this verse, verse 1. Uh, this is just a different, I threw this in because it's a different uh, way of explaining it. There is no authority but by act of God. Does that put it about as plain as it can be? And the existing authorities are instituted by him. Now that may mean that they're not acting in a very godly manner. But you know sometimes as your pastor, I don't act like I should. And the reason I know that it's because my wife is always telling me that. <laughs> she says, you know, I, you shouldn't say what you say because you're just, you're the pastor. And you sh shouldn't be doing that. And Billy's back there shaking her head yes to. She, it's amazing how much sisters agree. <laughs> and, and so, but you see, the point of it is, is that when I don't act, as godly as I should, I know that I'm still going to have to be accountable to God. And because I am I'm trying to be a godly pastor, um, that causes me to do godly things sometimes because I know that there are consequences for me if I get in a sinful mode. Just as a Christian, you should know that. And so we should be doing what we're doing, our attitudes. See, we're talking attitude here. Our attitudes should be, we should do what the Bible tells us to do. Not because we have to. My kids used to always say, oh, Dad, do I have to? And of course, I always said, no, you don't have to, sweetheart. You get to. <laughs> you see? And so, so we've got the situation, of course, Peter honored this as well. He said in 1 Peter uh, 2.17, honor the king, honor the king. That's why I get so upset when I see people trashing the president. It doesn't mean that I don't agree with them. 95% of the time, you know, I probably agree with half of what they're saying. 
But the thing of it is, is the Bible tells me to honor my king, honor my president. You see, because if he's doing things that are not <coughs> godly, does God need me to go to bed for him? Does God need me to stand up and be defensive on, on his behalf? No. No. God can take care of himself. So, here's another scripture. Uh, and this is out of the book of, uh, out of Daniel. Uh, in the book of, of Daniel, we're talking, again, the same, the same concept. Nebuchadnezzar, who was this tyrannical king, had been brought, in other words, God had dealt with him because he was not acting like a godly king at the time. And so God really dealt with him while he was the tyrant, right in the middle of his, of his kingdom. And took him down a few pegs. And so what Nebuchadnezzar was, was brought to a place where he had to realize he was humbled. He was humbled by God. And God had taught him some painful lessons. And here's Daniel's point of that. It, it's on verse 17. For this has been decreed by the messengers. Now this is Nebuchadnezzar talking. This has been decreed by the messengers. It was commanded by the holy ones. So that everyone you may know uh, realizes that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world. <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar, the tyrant king, is saying the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to to anyone he chooses. So God gives these kingdoms to anybody he chooses, even to the lowliest of people. Well, why would God do that? Why would he give a kingdom to a lowly person? Well, we can just look back in history and, and, and give example after example on that, can't we? Of kings that were not probably the best examples in a moral situation or doing what's right. So the first thing we need to recognize is that regardless of the form of government we may be up against, the hand of God is in it. Okay, the second thing we need to know about a relationship to the government is found in verse 2 of Romans. This is chapter 13, verse 2. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. The NIV says it this way, those who rebel against authority will bring judgment on themselves. So what do you think is going to happen to these people that trash the government on Facebook? What did I just say? Anybody who is rebelling against authority, against what God has instituted, will be punished or will bring judgment on themselves. Guys, this is serious business. Serious business. And if you know somebody who's doing that, you need to pray for them regularly. Especially when they identify themselves as a Christian. What's the essence of the commandment, the, the greatest commandment? We love the Lord God with all our hearts and we love our neighbor as ourselves. Are we showing the love of God when we do this when we're just griping and complaining and... no, no and why do we do that? because the point is we are letting God live through us so that people see him in us so they will be drawn to him if we're trashing the president on Facebook are we drawing people to God? <clears throat> Now you begin to understand why I got so many phone calls. And what can I do? I can talk to a person, and I did. But again, you see, you've got elements. Are you part of the team? Are you sub subject to authority? Are you accountable? Well, I don't have to be accountable to you. Well, I just have to be accountable to God. Oh, if God is in me, Matthew 18 says if you had odds with your brother, you go to that brother and you say, I've seen some areas that you need to approve on. You try to get that guy to repent or that gal. You see? But they may not listen to you. 
So if that doesn't work, and they continue on in the same way, you see, then you take one or two people with you. And you say, well, you've got this issue in your life. And uh, with pastors, it always seems to be about the church secretary, you know. See, we don't have to worry about that because we don't have a church secretary. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but you see, it's happened in a lot of situations where that has happened. Maybe the pastor was having an affair with the secretary. And so people have gone to the pastor. And you know what? A lot of times they don't listen. And then finally, Matthew 18 says, you go to that person one-on-one, -on -one, you take one or two people with you, and then if it still doesn't work, you bring it before church leadership. Now that does, it says before the church. That doesn't mean you stand up in Sunday service and point the guy out. <laughs> what that means is, is you take it to the leadership of the church, the elders, and, you know, the, whatever the authority of the church is, and you bring it before them. And they call the person in. And they, you know, will you stop having an affair with them? this gal, you know, and, and, and repent so you can be the pastor of the church or be a pastor. And you know, a lot of times they say no. And then at that point, what we do is we treat them like a non-believer. I used to think that that meant that we kick them out of the church. And Randy pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago, that wasn't what that means. Treating a person like a non-believer doesn't mean we excommunicate them. It means we don't have the same level of relationship with them that we had before. Now that person may need to be let go or fired from his position. So we see that anybody who re rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. Again, not the lightning bolt coming out of the sky. Just simply means that they're not going to walk in the blessings of God. Things are, going to, are not going to be going well for that person. All right. So clearly if God is behind all governments, then those who oppose the government and will overthrow it are really not, you know, you know are really opposing God. Now, I'm not going to get into this in a heavy detail. I know that's a touchy subject. And it has to be handled very, very carefully. And I know I'm on touchy ground. There's two sides of this. And again, if you want to discuss this with me separately, I'll be happy to discuss it after the service or something. We can go have coffee sometime and I'll talk to you about it, okay? But basically what I'm just saying, I'm dealing with an attitude. I'm not talking about those who openly rebel against the government. I'm talking about who have an attitude that think they can criticize and don't seem to recognize that the government that we have was brought about by God to begin with. See the difference? And how, as Christians, do we reflect? How are we coming across to the people out there? What do they see in us? Now, there's some things that nations have no right to do, and governments have no right to get into, and I'll, I'll just outline a couple of those. The Bible's clear on these things as well. And you remember the story. We all know the story. Uh, the Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus, and they were trying to trap him. And so Jesus, uh, in the in the story, it's the famous incident that he took a coin and held it up, and he said, "Whose image is on this coin?" And they all said, "Well, Caesar's." And he said, "All right, then give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, but give to God the things that belong to God." Okay. Now by this, he clearly indicated that there are limits to the power of government. And Caesar had his image on certain things, therefore those things belonged to him. And rightfully so, Jesus was saying. But Caesar put his image, uh, what he put his, put his image on, by implication, he extends that this also includes a lot of things in the world. So we're all aware of the fact that governments have authority of what we do with our, our property and how we behave with one another. But our Lord clearly indicates that the government has no right to touch what God has put his image on, which is the spirit of man. In other words, Caesar has no right to command the worship of man or forbid his obedience to the word of God. Now when that begins to happen, 
the government's getting out of line. Okay? Because rulers are under God. Therefore, they have no right to command men to do what God says ought not to be done. Or to command men not to do what God says should be done. Now, these are the limits of governmental powers. Governments are not to enslave men because men belong to God. Now, you might say to me, well, gee, Pastor Bill, the Bible's full, especially in the Old Testament, of people. Well, even in the New Testament, because Titus, that's what Titus was about. Okay? And the government is not, and the Bible's not taking a stand one way or another on that. What the Bible is saying, if you're in a situation where slavery exists and you're a slave, then be a godly slave. That's the point. Because if you remember the story, the slave ran away from, from his owner and got involved with Paul. And Paul basically ministered to him and said, you know, go back and be the best slave you can be. He's not condoning slavery. He's saying that if you're in that situation, be Christian about your approach, your attitude, you see. And he did, he went back, and, and the slave went back and got the owner saved. And got it so that the owner had a relationship. So there was good that came out of the fact that he was a slave. Okay, I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying God used that situation and, and made good come out of it. All right, well, let's look at some of these other scriptures. In verse 3, For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Then do what is right, and they will honor you. Gosh. And then, in verse 4, Paul is saying this, the authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. Now, this is kind of a helpful because, because there are two basic functions of government. One, governments are to protect us from evil. Okay, and for that purpose, the governments properly have armies and police systems and courts of justice that preserve us from evil in our midst. And then in verse six, we have another function of government: pay your taxes. Now, I'm sorry, I just went from preaching to meddling in your personal life. <laughs> Let me repeat that again: pay your taxes too. For these same reasons, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Now, in the first scripture where it talks about the servants of God, the word that is used for servants is the same word that we get our word deacon from. Okay, And so, so what it's saying is that the servants, the policemen, those that are involved, that have authority over you, are like deacons. They serve you. But here, in this scripture, when it talks about ministry, it says the word that's used for servants of God or serving God, it's more like a priest or like a ministry priest. Okay? So the idea here is that the government is not only to provide our defense and security, but also to provide certain common services that we all need to function as priests among us, helping us in our needs. For example, out of this grows the function of government in providing mail service, or utilities, water, sewage, schools, relief agencies, and many other functions of government. And in order to make these services possible, governments, by God's grace, have two powers given to them. In verse 4, for they have the power to punish you. One translation said, he bears not the sword for nothing. Whenever you see the word sword in the Bible, it's talking about, it's, it's kind of symbolic of force. The sword is the symbol of the right to use force. And I'll just say this, there's probably no area where, where people are more confused and muddled than in the area of capital punishment. I'm just amazed when I see all the Christians out there picketing against capital punishment. 
Well, who do you think gave us the idea about capital punishment to start with? Where do you think it came from? It came from God. It came from the Bible. Okay? Now, you and I can debate this. If you're on the opposite of that, that's fun. It's okay. That's one of those things that we can disagree on and still walk away and still be brothers and sisters in Christ. But I just want to say that I think that there is a place in the Bible for capital punishment. Um, because what people need to understand is that when the state, acting in line with the judicial system, finally passes a sentence on an individual to yield his life for a certain crime, it's really not man taking a man's life. It's God taking that life in, by means of the state. Do you understand that? Because God has authorized the state to have that authority and that power. Okay? And he also has the right, God, to set up channels for doing this. And that means that governments have the basic right to maintain armies for their defenses. And folks, that means even for Christians. And that means that Christians are to serve in those armies. Now I know there are Christian denominations out there who disagree with that. And that's fine. But my point is just simply this. It's, you know, we're touching on matters that are hotly debated. And, and I don't have time to, to deal with all these issues uh, completely today. But the point I want you to get is this. It's folly to try to eliminate the rightful uses of authority because some of them are being abused. Now, did you hear what I said? It is folly to eliminate the rightful uses of authority. We have a group out there by a political action group who are trying to gain one up on us. We have the right in this country to bear arms. And so every time something comes up and somebody gets shot by a nut, this group rises up and says we need to, to give up our guns. And the Bible is saying it's folly to do that. Because that is our right by our Constitution. And remember, the people who wrote the Constitution were ordained pastors. So in other words, just because a nut shoots somebody, you see what they're doing is they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. See? Enough said on that. I just want you to think about things. The second power of this passage says as governments rightfully have from God is they have the right to protect, secure, and provide common services. Taxes is the one that we wanted to talk about there. <laughs> Finally in uh, verse 7, give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are already in authority. I can't say it any better than that. Give respect and honor to those who are in authority. And I guess basically Paul is saying this. Don't resent these powers of the government. Do not be conformed to the thinking of the present age. Don't act like everybody else acts about taxes. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you that they're not gross injustices in our government and in this world today. But basically, Paul kind of begins to get the idea that God gives us the government that we deserve. Now, we all have complaints about things that are going on in our country. Could it be that God has given us exactly what we deserve? <laughs> When you think back at some of the ungodly things that we've done, some of the immoral things that we've done in our country, you see? But basically what Paul is saying here is he just wants us to have a different attitude than the world. 
in these matters. That's basically all I'm saying. You may agree or disagree with me, and if you do, that's okay. But what's your attitude in the way? That's the thing I'm complaining about. And I'm not going to say a lot about those kind of things unless I get about 20 phone calls regarding that. And then I have to deal with it, because I'm your pastor. Randy and I talk about this all the time. We feel we have a responsibility. A pastor is a shepherd. A shepherd protects their flock from the wolves. And Randy and I take that very, very seriously. Again, somebody has well said every nation tells the government, gets to the government that it, was, it deserves. Therefore, folks, let's respond as Christians with cheerfulness and gladness for what we can do to honor God, God within our government. Yes. And let's do it in such an attitude that people will see that there is something different about us and in us. Yes. That makes sense? Yes. Dan, come on back.